All right, if you've got your Bible with you, and I hope you do, we're going to be in Romans chapter 5 again this morning. In the newsletter, I ask if you remembered having to do essays in high school that were compare and contrast essays. I don't know if you remember those specific kinds of essays. When our kids were in high school, uh, the summer before their senior year, this was the time when they were doing summertime homework assignments. I mean, I couldn't believe that their teachers gave them homework for the summer, but they had to, over the summer, to be prepared for senior year English, they had to read the book Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. Do we have a picture of that? There you go. Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, novel written in uh, 1899 about a trip down the Congo River into the, the deepest, darkest parts of Africa. Anybody read Heart of Darkness? Okay, some of you have. I've not read it. I have no idea. But in 1979, there was a movie that came out that was based on Heart of Darkness. It was not called Heart of Darkness. In fact, the stories were completely different, but the, the movie had as its source Heart of Darkness. Anybody know what the movie was? That's correct. Show there. there. It's Apocalypse Now, Francis Ford Coppola's 1979 movie. Now, some high schools, they didn't do this at Little Rock Christian, but some high schools, if you read Heart of Darkness, they wanted you to watch Apocalypse Now, and you would write your compare and contrast essay about the similarities and differences between what you found in Heart of Darkness and in Apocalypse Now. But I knew that there were not enough people here in this congregation who had read and seen that for us to have that exercise. So I decided we would do a different exercise around compare and contrast this morning. I thought we should compare this person, Luke Skywalker, with this person, Anakin Skywalker, okay? because I knew everybody would be able to make that comparison, all right? So who can give me what some similarities between Luke and Anakin? Anybody? What? Bad hair. That's one. <laughs> it's 80s hair. So what is it? They both have the same last name. They're related. They both know something about the Force. They're, bo they're both missing a hand. That's true. What else? What? Dark? Now you're into contrast. Now, and we'll hold on to the contrast side of things, but they both grew up on Tatooine. You may not have remembered that, right? They are both Jedis. Both were trained by Obi-Wan. There we go. <laughs> there are people who are going, I just don't want to reveal what a nerd I am <laughs> by saying that I understand the, the similarities and differences. Both of them fell in love with royalty, and, but Luke kind of had to back off when he realized the girl he was in love with was his sister, all right? Contrast. Okay, now we get to the contrast. There's really one big contrast in all of this, right? What's the big contrast? One's on the dark side, the other's on the, on the good side, right? Now, there is a reason that I picked Luke and Anakin for our compare and contrast. Now, let me be clear. I don't want anybody going out of here saying... Our pastor was teaching us this morning that Luke and Anakin are a picture of Jesus and Adam, okay? That's not, that's not, we, we don't want to go too deep into the mythology of Star Wars here to get there. But as we do compare and contrast Jesus and Adam, we do find that there is darkness and light pictured in that contrast. We looked at the first part of this passage last week, and we saw in in the second half of Romans chapter 5, Paul is doing his compare and contrast around the first man and the second man, Jesus and, or Adam and Jesus. And we saw that he is, he is uh, explaining what it means for a believer to be in union with Jesus. And he's starting by saying there's already union with Adam among all of humanity, but now we want to talk about what union with Jesus looks like for those who become followers of Jesus. And you may remember that we looked at three illustrations to describe that union. We talked about marriage as a picture of the union. We talked about adoption as a picture of that union. We talked about the vine and the branches being a biblical picture of that union. And I said Paul is answering this question that's on the mind of his readers, which is how could the death of one man possibly pay for the sins of so many people? How could one man, how could all of the blessings of God come to so many people worldwide because of the death of one man? That's a good question. And that's what Paul is trying to answer in the second half of Romans chapter 5. And you remember we talked about how, how Adam was our federal head, 
back in the garden and we talked about the whole idea of imputation that something that doesn't belong to us gets credited to us and and those ideas are being explained in this passage and you will remember I quoted Curtis Thomas I'm gonna quote him again because he gives us a summary of what we're seeing in this in this book and and by the way this is from his interpretive outline of the book of Romans which if you don't have in your library you ought to have and you ought to be reading ahead of time before you come here on Sunday read Curtis's notes before you come and Curtis brought six copies with him this morning which was all he had so if you don't have a copy get your copy from Curtis and if we run out of the first six we will and how much are they okay cost him seven dollars so you should give him eight okay or nine or ten all right so come get the book from Curtis this morning here's what he says about this section of Romans he says Paul's design here is to show that just as the race was condemned on the ground of the imputation of Adam's one sin even so believers are justified on the ground of the imputation of Christ's righteousness the central idea of the passage is that men are saved in precisely the same manner, manner in which they were lost through the act of another. So this morning we'll look at the compare and contrast of Jesus and Adam in the second half of Romans 5. We're going to read through it again, but let me pray before we dive into our text, okay? Pray with me. Lord, we are grateful, we're thankful for your word, for all that it tells us about life and about joy and about peace and about our great hope but most of all we are grateful that in your word we come to know you so our prayer this morning is that we would see you in this passage we would see your glory and your greatness we would better understand the goodness of the gospel as we read this passage this morning and we ask these things in Jesus name amen Romans 5 we're beginning at verse 12 and I'm going to read it slowly because you have to read this slowly to, uh, to catch on. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who is to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. The free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Let me again, I want to remind you of the structure of what we've just read because it helps you understand the flow here. Back at the beginning, Paul starts in verse 12 with his thesis statement, his main idea, and he, he gets halfway through his thesis statement before he runs a couple of bunny trails. So the first half of the thesis statement, if Adam's actions could have an impact on all of his descendants, and they did, then in the same way, Jesus' actions can have an impact on all of his descendants, those who are his through the new birth. That's the thesis. And he gets halfway through by explaining Adam's actions did have an impact on all of humanity. And in this compare and contrast, this is where Jesus and Adam have something in common. Both of them acted in a way with their actions having an impact on all who would follow them. 
And Paul begins by saying in verse 12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, death through sin, sin spread to all men because uh, uh, all have sinned. And then he stops. He's explained what Adam's done, but he stops and he runs a bunny trail. And and his sidebar, his bunny trail, is is at that dash at the end of verse 12. He says, before I finish my main thought, let me explain something. We covered sidebar number one last week. Paul says, I, I know you're asking how can... God hold people accountable for their sin if he had not yet given them the law. And Paul says in verses 13 and 14 that sin was in the world before the law came. Before, And we know that because people died and people were deliberately and knowingly, they were, they were not deliberately and knowingly violating the law of God because they hadn't been giving it yet, but they were still violating the law of God, right? Remember I used the illustration of speeding last week? I said, it's one thing if you speed and you go, I didn't realize the limit here was something. I remember one of my children getting a ticket on Green Mountain Road and came home and said, you know, it's 25? The speed limit's supposed to be 25 on Green Mountain Road? And I said, there, there's a sign there. I've never seen the sign. She didn't know, okay? But there's another thing. When you see that sign and you go, I don't care, I'm going to drive as fast as I want to. That's deliberately, knowingly violating. It's a different kind of sin. God says, I gave you a conscience. You're still culpable. You still should know when you're doing something wrong, but it's a different class of sin when you're deliberately violating. So that's the sidebar in verses 13 and 14. He's saying God still holds you accountable for that. And then at the end of verse 14 where he says that Adam was a type of Jesus, he says, now before I move back to my thesis, I got something else I got to clear up. And what he's clearing up here in sidebar number two is that Adam and Jesus do have some things in common, but we are not to think of them as twins. We're not to think of them as equivalent. Actually, Adam is not so much a type of Jesus. He's an anti-type of Jesus. They have some things in common, but they have more about which they are dissimilar. And we're going to come back to that and unpack that this morning. And then at verse 18, he's finally back to his main thought. He says, verse 12, just as Adam brought sin and death to all humanity. Then in verse 18, he recaps that, and toward the end of the chapter, he says, we're going to, uh, we're going to finish out what Christ has done. So that's, that's the structure. Now, with that said, let's go back and look at sidebar number two, verses 15 through 17, this second idea. His argument here is essentially that Adam and Jesus both did something that impacted all of humanity, but he wants you to understand what Adam did that impacted all of humanity was not as great as what Jesus did that impacts all of his followers. He's basically saying that grace has more power for good than sin has for evil. I'll say that again. Grace has more power to accomplish good than sin does to accomplish evil. Grace brings life Evil brings death and destruction, and, and that's powerful. Okay, sidebar number two. The actions of both Adam and Jesus have consequences on all, but we should not think of them as equal. So here's the first thing he says in verse 15. He says, the free gift is not like the trespass. There's something about the free gift that makes it greater than the trespass was. The gift of salvation is not like the sentence that was handed down for sin. Let me give you an illustration of what Paul is trying to is saying here, okay? Let's say that it was a bad week for you. Let's say that on on Thursday you had to go to court and you were charged with first degree murder. And the trial was over and the jury had found you guilty and it was up to the judge to sentence you. And the judge says you're going to die by lethal injection. You're going to be executed. You would call that a bad week, right? I mean, if that had happened to you. here and, and let's say somebody comes up to you and says, I know you've had a bad week, but I've got some good news for you. You can save 15% on your car insurance <laughs> by switching to GEICO. Okay. In that moment, the, the good news does not outweigh the bad news, does it? Let's say somebody comes up to you and says, I know they're going to execute you, but I'm going to give you a month in Hawaii before the execution. Now, that's better than the Geico, but it still does not outweigh what's coming. In this case, the bad news is worse than the good news. 
But let's say somebody comes up to you and says, I got good news for you. I have, I have arranged for your sentence to be commuted. You're going to be set free. You're not going to have to experience the death that you deserve. And instead, we're moving you into a really nice house in Chennai, and the Hawaii and the Geico thing get thrown in on top of that. Now, all of a sudden, the good news way outweighs the bad news, right? You've had not just a reversal of fortune, but you've had blessing added on top of that. This is what Paul is saying when he says that the free gift is not like the trespass. He said, the bad news that you were going to face sin, you're going to face judgment and death because of your sin, that's really bad news. The good news is not only that you're set free from that, but God has blessing to pour out on you. Huh. You see? Jesus didn't just come and say, I'm going to have your sentence overturned. Jesus came and said, I'm going to transform your life, and I'm going to give you a hope and a future. When Jesus, what Jesus brings through his death and resurrection is more than just a cancellation of a death sentence. He brings a promise of hope and a future. What was the trespass? Adam's rebellion. What did it bring? Sin and death. For whom? For all. Now, the, the question here, notice in verse 15 it says, many died through one man's trespass. And you're wondering, didn't everybody die through one man's trespass? That's a good question, right? Back in verse 12, he said, sin came to all, death came to all, all have sinned. Sounds like all back in verse 12, but here it says many died through one man's trespass. So is Paul contradicting himself in the space of four verses? No. He is saying that all have experienced sin and, and all have had it imputed to us because of Adam's sin. We talked about that last week. But will all who received the imputation of Adam's sin see judgment and death on the last day? No. Because of what Christ has done, many will receive judgment, but not all will. All were sentenced, but not all will face the execution. In verse 15, when he says many died, he's using a rhetorical device here. You're saying he's talking about it in, in past tense. Yeah, Paul does this. Paul sometimes uses past tense language to refer to a future certainty. So he will sometimes say things like they've already happened, even though they haven't happened yet, because he wants you to be certain. He's as certain that they're going to happen. He, he states it as, as if it's a done deal. So he says, many died. He's really talking about a future death where many will face eternal judgment, the final death. Because of, of the second half of verse 15. Or, or, or why is it that not all will die? It's because of the second half of verse 15. The sin is not like the trespass, or excuse me, the, the, the gift is not like the trespass. Much more has the grace of God and the free gift of the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Death came to all, but now the grace of God has abounded to many, and it's greater than the trespass, much more. He's not talking about the number of people. He's talking about the effect of God's grace coming to his children. So here's what it looks like. It's real clear. Jesus' gift is greater than Adam's trespass. It's real simple. I like what John MacArthur says about this in verse 15. He says, Paul is teaching us here that Jesus Christ broke the power of sin and death, but the converse is not true. Sin and death cannot break the power of Jesus Christ. The condemnation of Adam's sin is reversible. The redemption of Jesus is not. The effect of Adam's act is permanent only if not nullified by Christ. The effect of Jesus' act, however, is permanent for believing individuals and not subject to reversal or nullification. We have the great assurance that once we're in Jesus Christ, we're in him forever. That's why the free gift is greater than the, tra the trespass. Adam's sin brought death. Grace brings something more dynamic than death. It brings life. Here's another illustration. How many of you like to watch Chip and Joanna? You know, okay, the hands went up there. Some of you are going, who are Chip and Joanna? Chip and Joanna. Who doesn't know who Chip and Joanna? Let me, let me just see. 
Really? Okay. Chip and Joanna Gaines live in Waco, Texas, and they remodel houses there, and they've got a TV show called Fixer Upper, and it's a wildly popular TV show. I mean, we were having a discussion last week about whether people like Chip and Joanna better than the Pioneer Woman or not. This is how <laughs> big a deal it is, right? So if you, if you watch Fixer Upper, what is Chip's favorite day? There you go. <laughs> See? It's demo day. Chip loves to demo houses. Now, that doesn't mean demonstrate. What does it mean? Demolish. He loves to tear down the houses. He loves to get his sledgehammer and his pick and go tear down the sheetrock walls. How, how long does it take somebody to tear down the walls and do a demo day? It's quick. That's a pretty quick process. To destroy is quick and easy. To rebuild is harder and more exacting and more painstaking. The, the destruction that comes with sin and death is quick and easy. The gift is harder and more difficult, but it's more beautiful. It, the, the way the house looks when it's done is prettier than how bad it looks when it's been demoed. That's an illustration. Jesus' gift, God's grace, which rebuilds and restores, is greater than Adam's transgression, which brings death and destruction. Okay, that's verse 15. Now, verse 16 then says, the result of the free gift is different than the result of the trespass. The free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. So the contrast there is between one sin and many sins, and the result of one sin was condemnation. The result of many sins is justification. Here's what he's saying. One sin brings judgment, which brings condemnation. Many sins brings or activates the free gift of God, grace, which brings justification. The key difference here is that judgment came as a result of one sin. But God's grace and God's gift of justification doesn't simply cover one sin. It covers a multitude, millions of sins. So death and destruction came because of one sin. Righteousness and justification cover a multitude of sins. The gift is greater than the trespass because the gift undoes millions of trespasses. Okay, here's the third thing in the line of thinking. Verse 17, if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign through the one man, Jesus Christ. Here's what he's telling us. God hates sin and rebellion. He will judge rebels. He will pour out his wrath on those who ignore him or those who reject him. His hatred of sin is real. But you know what is greater than God's hatred of sin? God's love for repentant sinners. Now stop and think about that for just a second. God hates with a holy hatred sin. But God's love for sinners is stronger and greater and more powerful than even his hatred for sin. As great as his hatred is, greater still is his love. In fact, Paul says this in his letter to the Ephesians where he says, I pray that you'll come to understand how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. At the end of this section in Romans, at the end of chapter 8, he says nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And, and John says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. The gift is greater than the curse. Grace is greater than all our sin. Which brings us to verse 17, the ultimate effect of Adam's actions. And the key word here is reign, sin and death reign, or grace reigns. Adam's administration, Adam, if, if Adam's running for office, and, and he was, he was our representative, our federal head, so he's our great, 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 great granddaddy for all of us. We're all a part of his family. He's the head of the line. 
In his administration, his reign is a reign of death. All human beings are sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, born into that family. We follow his example and his ways. And as long as you're in Adam's family, see what I did there? <laughs> as long as you're in the Adam's family, okay, you are under the reign of death. They're spooky and they're kooky. Anyway, we won't. But if because of one man's trespass, this is what he's saying, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance and grace and the free gift of righteousness reign through the one man, Jesus Christ. Paul says, if you have a second birth, a, a new birth, the, spirit, the Bible talks about it being born again. So you're born into Adam's family, you are stuck there, you're in the reign of death. But if you have a second birth and now you're born into a new family, you're adopted into the family of God. If you're in that family, now you have a different reign. Now there's a different reign. It's the reign of grace, the reign of life. And children of God who are under the reign of life receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness because of the one man, Jesus Christ. So verses 15 through 17, Adam and Jesus may have similarities, but both men, because both men did something, their actions uh, led to consequences for many people, but it's clear from these verses that what Jesus passes on to his followers is greater than what Adam passes on to his children. That's the point. Everyone is either under the reign of Adam or under the reign of Jesus, under the reign of death or the reign of life. And the question for everybody is, which reign are you under? Are you still a child of Adam or are you a child of Christ? That's, that's the fundamental issue he's getting to here. If you are a child of Adam, you are under the reign of sin and death, and what is coming for you is judgment. If you are a child of God, born into the family of God through the new birth, adopted into his family, if that's who you are, what's coming for you is life and grace and righteousness. And it's not just in the future. It starts when you're born into his family. If you hear God's voice and you respond to his call and you believe in him and follow him, you have that new life. You have a new hope, a new future, a new hope. I threw in another Star Wars reference there, okay? Sorry. In fact, I could say, this is your destiny. Well, we, we won't do that. In, in fact, just, just to keep the Star Wars thing going here for a second, and, and forgive, again, I don't want you to go home and say, they preached on Star Wars at church, but just remember that, that Darth Vader was saying to Luke, join the dark side, remember? We're all born on the dark side. It's not being invited to join the dark side. That's where you are when you're born. The question is, are you going to join life and grace? Are you going to hear God's voice, respond to his voice, and say, I'm going to follow him? Okay, now we're back to our main point. End of verse 12. If this is what, if, if sin came through one man's transgression, then you get to verse uh, 18, it says, therefore, one trespass led to condemnation for all men. Here's the conclusion of that thought. So one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. One act of righteousness. This is not referring to a single act. This is not saying Jesus did this one thing, and that one thing was where the switch got flipped. No, his life is the one act of righteousness. His whole life, his obedience to the Father. In fact, Theologians will refer to this often as his active obedience. We have Jesus' active obedience and his passive obedience. Active is where he is determining what he will do in obedience to the Father. Passive is where he is letting happen to him things that need to happen to him. That's his passive obedience. We often, it, it's not technically correct. Some people will say, well, his active obedience was his life. His passive obedience was his death. No, even in his death, he was being actively obedient, and even in his life, there were times of passive obedience. They really meld together. But, but it was the one act is the act of his life that was his obedience. And, and what it's saying here is that his life never deviated once from the purpose or plan of God. Never once. He was never, there was never a point in his life where he said, you know what, I'm going to do this instead. And as a result of his perfect obedience... He accrued righteousness, and that righteousness is what gets imputed to his children. But did you note there in verse 18? A little tricky thing there. It says, 
something about all men. You see that? Okay, so what are we going to do with that? What does that mean? Is Paul teaching universalism here? You know what universalism is? If it's all men, everybody gets saved. There are some people who believe that because of what Jesus did, everybody gets saved. In the end, everybody's going to heaven because of what Jesus did. Now, that's not what Paul is saying. That's not what this verse is teaching. If Paul was saying that, he would be contradicting what he has already said. You don't have to turn here, but back in chapter 3, just a little bit ago, here's what he said. The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. For who? For all who believe. Not for all men, but for all who believe. But here it says it's for all men. Well, here's what you have to understand. Sometimes when the Bible says all, it doesn't mean all everywhere at all times. All doesn't, and and I'm not trying to weasel words here, but all doesn't always mean all. For example, Scripture in Acts 2 says this, God pours out his spirit on the day of Pentecost. Here's what it says. He poured out his spirit on all people. Now, that's what it says. Now, did he pour out on all people? It doesn't mean every single human being in the world, but what he's saying here is he poured it out without distinction on all groups of people, all kinds of people. There in Acts chapter 2, there were people from every nation, tongue, and tribe who had come to Jerusalem, and he poured it out on all of them, not just on the Jews. Okay, In, in Acts 19... Luke tells us that Paul was in Ephesus, and it says he reasoned for two years in the hall of Tyrannus. He would go there and he would speak. And then he says, and all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Now, it doesn't mean all people heard it. It means both Jews and Greeks. All means not just our sect, but all kinds of people. One more example of how all doesn't always mean all. In 1 John chapter 2, Uh, John says, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. That doesn't mean that Jesus is the propitiation of sins for the whole world, for everybody. If it did, that would teach universalism. But it means not just for Jews, but for all people. Now you're back to where we are in this passage. when, When Paul is saying here that Jesus gift comes to all men, he means all who are his children, all who are followers, Jews and Gentiles, all who are from every tongue, tribe, and nation. So it's not an all as in all-inclusive, it's an all as in multifaceted. Verse 19, then he says, for by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. By one man's obedience, there will be many made righteous. Again, we're back around, it's many. It's not all, it's many. Here's a summary of what's been said, this verse, a summary of everything he's said in the second half of Romans 5. Paul makes it clear that in Adam's disobedience, many were made sinners. In Jesus' obedience, many were made righteous. That word made is a significant word there. It doesn't say that they had the propensity for or that they they acted that. It says they were made. This is the imputation word. Because of what Adam did, you were made a sinner. Because of what Jesus does, you are made righteous. Sin is credited to your account because of what Adam did. Not because of your sin, but because Adam's sin was deposited in your account and you now owned it at the beginning. In the same way, Jesus' righteousness is deposited into your account. You now own it and possess it. It's your possession even though Jesus is the one who earned it. In fact, Dr. Lloyd-Jones, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this way. He says, look at yourself in Adam. Though you had done nothing, you were declared a sinner. Look at yourself in Christ and see that though you had done nothing, you're declared to be righteous. That's the parallel. So Paul is making the argument about how Jesus' life and death and resurrection can bring so much blessing to so many people. Now, you get to the end of this chapter, and there are these last two verses. He's, he's really done with his argument, but there's a third sidebar that kind of pops in here. The third sidebar. Paul knows his Jewish friends who are reading this are thinking to themselves, wait a sec. They, I get the idea that Adam, Adam's sin comes to all men, but they're saying to themselves, Moses fixed that. <laughs> Moses fixed that when he brought the law of God. I'm a follower of Moses. 
I'm a follower of the law of God. Moses is our God, is our guy, and and the law is the pathway to righteousness. That's what they're saying. That's how a good observant Jew in Jesus' day would have thought. We're not under Adam's reign. We're under the reign of the law. We're under the reign of Moses. In fact, last week, you remember, I, I had the campaign poster for Adam. You remember that? I put the, can we put, there's my Adam, his campaign slogan, do what you feel. Do whatever feels good to you. Okay, we're all, we all bought into that. He's our daddy. Well, now the Jews says, I've got a new campaign poster. It's Moses. And it's cut off here, but it says, keep God's law, right? So we got Charles Heston there looking like President Obama, okay? So um, now, what... What does it mean here when Paul is saying uh, uh, this compare and contrast of Adam and, and, and Jesus, he sneaks in here a third sidebar. He says, I want to answer one more question, and that is, why do we need Jesus when we have the law? Because the Jew's going to be asking that. So he says the reason for the law was never to give you a pathway to righteousness. The reason for the law was to increase the trespass. That's what it says there in verse 20. What does that mean? Well, you remember last week we talked about the difference between sins and trespasses? All trespasses are sins, but not all sins are trespasses. A trespass is a willful disobedience against the revealed will of God. And there is more culpability and greater sinning involved when you know what's wrong, but you do it anyway. When, when, G, uh, when Joseph's brothers threw him in the pit and left him there for dead, were they sinning when they did that? Everybody agree? Had the law been given yet? No. Did they know what they were doing was wrong? Their conscience bore witness to it, but they, they didn't have a law standing there condemning them for what they did. That came later. When, when Abraham lied to Pharaoh and said, she's not my sister, she's my wife. She's not my wife, she's my sister. When he lied, was he sinning? Yes. Did he have a law to tell him that? No, all he had was his conscience to tell him that. So the Jew says, okay, we get that, but when the law came, it now says, do this and you'll live. Right? But nobody can do that. Let me, let me go back. There are two words in, in verse 20, two Greek words that are used, one that's translated trespass and one that's translated sin. And the, the two words, got to be careful here, they don't, have, they don't have an exact meaning that is for all time, you have to understand a word by its context, but in general, the first word that's translated trespass is paraptima, which is a word that literally means to go against. Strong says it's derived from a word that means a willful transgression of a known rule of life and involves guilt. That's a paraptima. The word translated sin is the word harmartia, which Strong's defines as missing the true end and scope of our lives, which is God, missing the mark. So there's a difference between a paraptima and a harmartia. One has more uh, culpability. Paul says to his Jewish friends, the law was not given to lead you to righteousness. It was given to increase your awareness of your sin, to increase your guilt, and to make it clear to you that you needed somebody to rescue you from the problem you were in. So, verse 20, the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our, our Lord. The default mode in life is for everybody to follow Adam and his ways. That's how you're wired at birth. That leads to sin and death. So you might say, I'm going to pick door number two. I'm going to pick Moses. I'm going to follow the law. That'll solve my problem. But Paul's saying that doesn't solve your problem. It increases your problem because it increases your guilt. You're now more culpable. You're still sinning. Even when you're following the law, you're still sinning. But now you've got the, the added problem. You know it's wrong and you still do it. The only option, Paul says, that will get you to righteousness is the grace option. Not the Adam option, not the Moses option, it's the grace option. You need grace to reign through righteousness that leads to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the argument of this second half of Romans 5. Now, a couple of thoughts just to focus our minds as we prepare to come to the Lord's table and receive communion this morning. Again, keep in mind Paul's saying here, Jesus' gift is greater than Adam's trespass. 
you should you should have that burned into your mind that little formula you should put that on your mirror you should remind yourself every day Jesus gift is greater than Adam's trespass God's love for his children God's love for you is greater and stronger than his anger toward your sin the blessing God gives to his children doesn't stop with him simply fixing our dilemma and saving us from judgment and hell. It's that, but it's more. God doesn't just get you out of the mess you were in. God brings you into his family, and that gift is infinitely greater than the trespass. But you have to respond to it. When, when God offers a gift, you, you must respond to it. In, in the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews quotes Psalm 95 and says this, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as the children of Israel did in their rebellion. If you're here this morning and God is speaking to your heart and saying, you know, this is true. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. The only way to righteousness and life and grace is through Christ. You can't find it through Adam. You can't find it through Moses. You can't find it through other world religions. You can't find it through yoga. You can't find it through whatever path you're on. The only path to grace is the path of Christ. If today God is affirming that in your heart, do not harden your heart. Do not ignore it. Do not say, well, I'll think about that more later. In fact, as soon as God excites that impulse in the heart of somebody, the next thing that happens is Satan comes along and says, don't think about that right now. Chew on that for a while. Think about that later. Don't respond to that. You need a lot of time to think about these things. No. If God is speaking to you and confirming, you know what, that that sounds true, then believe. (laughs) Then say, I need to follow Jesus. Turn your life over to him. God wants this to be your day. If you're hearing his voice, let's talk. Let's talk about you becoming a child of God by believing and following and surrendering and submitting your life to Christ. We're going to celebrate here together for those who have already become children of God through the offer of God's grace. If that's you, we're going to celebrate what Jesus has done for us by coming to the table and sharing in the meal that God has called us to share in together as his children. It's a meal that causes us to reflect on his goodness and his grace and the sacrifice. And I so appreciated the time that Mike took with us this morning to take us through the the catechism questions and help us understand who should and who shouldn't be coming to this meal. It's for the children of God, the children of God who are yielded to him, the children of God who are not stubborn and stiff-necked, the children of God who want the grace of God in their lives and who want to obey him. If that's you, if you're whether you're a visitor, a member, You are welcome at this table to come celebrate what God has done for you. If you're here this morning and you're going, you know, I think maybe I'm still in the tribe of Adam, then don't come and take the meal and and eat and drink judgment on yourself, as the catechism said, as the scriptures say. But instead, contemplate what God has done for you and how the gift is greater than the trespass and how what God has for you is infinitely greater than what's ahead for you in the judgment for your sin. Think about those things as, as we uh, come to the Lord's table. Here's how we'll do communion this morning. We will come down the outer aisles to come to the table to receive the bread and the juice. Take those back to your seat, and you can uh, hold on to them. We'll take them together in just a minute. We have both wine and grape juice available for your choice, and we also have gluten-free wafers as well as the crackers as you come through the line. So you prepare your hearts to come to the table while I prepare the table.
these elements are elements that picture for us the price that was paid for the gift to be ours. These are, these are elements that picture for us the cost of grace. We, we talk a lot about grace being something that's free. It's free to us, but it came with a cost. It came with the broken body and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. As he gathered with his disciples for the Passover meal on the night before his crucifixion, he took the bread, and after he prayed a prayer of blessing, he tore it, and he shared it with his disciples. He said, take this, eat it. This is my body broken for you. And as often as you receive this, he said, remember me. So, Lord Jesus, we come this morning to remember you and to think again, to think afresh about the gift, to think about the sacrifice, to think about the cost, to think that what is credited to our account came not because of any works of righteousness we'd done, but because of your perfect obedience, your perfect righteousness. Lord, we thank you for that sacrifice, and we receive this bread now with grateful hearts as we feast on Christ in our hearts. Amen. In the same way, after the meal was completed, Jesus took the cup. He prayed a prayer of blessing again for the cup, and then he passed it. And he said, drink this. This cup is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for the remission of sins. God making a new and living way for his children to be united with him through the, the shed blood of Jesus that pays the penalty for our crimes and that offers us the gift of eternal life. He said, as often as you drink this, remember me. And so again this morning, Lord, we do remember. We remember your sacrifice. We remember the pain. We remember the agony. We remember that you were separated from the Father. We remember that sin was, was imputed to you in that moment so that righteousness could be imputed to us. We thank you for that gift that great gift. And we drink this now with grateful hearts as we feast on Christ in our hearts. Amen. We're going to stand and sing the last verse of How Deep the Father's Love for Us, and then I'll dismiss us with a benediction this morning. I will not boast in anything, no gift, no power, no I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know. open hearts and open hands receive this blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.